guess who's back? After my longest hiatus yet, I'm here not to provide the Q&A that's taking way longer than expected, and instead to just sit back and relax with you for a more chill subject. I'm starting to run out of major white star liners to talk about without doing repeats. So instead of doing the Mauritania like all the big content creators, I've opted to go after the illustrious RMS Oceanic 2. I used to think Oceanic was too popular for anything new to be said about it. If anything, Oceanic is far from the fanboy ship I thought it was, the glaring example of a fanboy ship seeming pretty evident to me now. <laughs> so, with suspense fully built over the course of two long and painful months, I'm sure, I have returned to preach the good news of the RMS Oceanic 2. Three hundred seventeen is an excellent number. It's prime, and no matter how you scramble around the digits, it can be reorganized to make three hundred seventeen. This number just so happens to be the keel number of the brand new liner laid down in January of 1897, launched two years later. Ambitious as she was large, she would be the first vessel to exceed the length of Brunel's dumpster fire, the SS Great Eastern. Her monstrous size earned her the nickname Queen of the Seas. Today, a title reserved for a beloved 1961 film in which a woman, quote, disguises herself as a man so that she can approach women and steal their jewelry. The launch of the Oceanic was witnessed by the owner of the White Star Line, Thomas Ismay, and his wife. Shortly after the launch, he complained of chest pains and died of a series of heart attacks later that year. Good omens? Now, the Oceanic was larger than the Great Eastern in length, but not overall tonnage. But I'm under-exaggerating her importance and, most of all, her elegance. She boasted the largest four-cylinder triple expansion engines in the world. Quite a feat for the time, I assure you. And she was so large that an enormous 500-ton gantry crane had to be installed at Harland & Wolf for her construction. Size matters a lot less than many will make you believe, however. Her true claim to fame was her luxury. This beautifully colorized photograph of Oceanic's grand staircase is one of my favorite photos of all time, and it captures a small glimpse of the grandeur of the liner. White Star's strategy starting with 1897's Simric was focusing on the comfort of their liners over their speed, and Oceanic is where they mastered this practice. The Oceanic is one of White Star's legendary liners for a reason, the first one in a while actually, and her beauty is what makes her stand out from the rest. I know how that feels. Now in the early 20th century, the primary social event of the day was usually dinner, so generally the dining saloon would be some of the most intricately decorated locations on board an ocean liner. Oceanic featured incredible artwork around her skylight, personifying America, Britain, Liverpool, and New York with these ladies up here. It's clear they kept their mouth closed so the British one wouldn't have to show her bad teeth, but putting that aside, the New York one doesn't look nearly pissed enough. Strangely, Oceanic's smoking room doors were notable enough to be mentioned by Charles Lightoller in his 1935 book. Quote, her smoke room doors were a masterpiece in themselves and cost 500 pounds. Officer Lightoller received the bulk of his training aboard the Oceanic, as what he described to be seven hard though happy years. He described the ship in detail. The usual custom is to build two ships, as with the Britannic and Germanic, Teutonic and Majestic. Then in lone and stately majesty came the Oceanic. She was an experiment, and a wonderfully successful one. Built by Harland and Wolfe, regardless of cost, elaborate to a degree, money lavished where it was necessary, but never gaudily, as is so common nowadays. Old people have been complaining about the modern times for centuries. Now, advertising has always been a good way of getting people to buy things. And examining what companies put in their advertising is a good way of indicating what companies consider highlights of their product. This is a 1907 White Star Line pamphlet detailing a brief history of the line as well as some info on some of her ships. This pamphlet basically functions as a highlight reel for the Oceanic's interiors, and since I can't do the Oceanic justice, I'll just let this pamphlet take over. The library is described as a key feature of the vessel. The octagonal skylight with its graceful arches rising to a height of over 12 feet from the floor. The treatment of the ceiling in broad panels, with scroll ornaments in low relief, gilt upon a white ground, and the dainty decoration of the sliding shutters of all the ports. All these, whilst charming in themselves, are a delightful contrast to the dark mahogany of the tables, bookcases, chairs, and seats. Small wonder that the library on the Oceanic is a favorite resort. Good lord, White Star. Politicians don't boast as much as you do. Ismay, you sly dog. They did put their money where their mouth is, though. These are accurate descriptions of the ship. But it seems wrong to plagiarize an advertising agent from 115 years ago, so I'm gonna move on. Now, before the invention of the pulmonary function test, smoking was a great American pastime, and ships used to feature intricate smoking rooms incomparable to the stained drywall chambers we call smoking rooms today. Oceanics was on another level, however. It was one of her hotspots of architecture. 
In addition to the stunning arches painted white with gold trim, the room featured oil paintings depicting the life of everyone's favorite historical figure, Christopher Columbus. Staterooms were your standard for the era. Third class were bare bones and separated single men from women, with men in the bow and women in the stern. Cabins ranged from two or four berths to glorified steerage with 20 beds loaded in one big room. Second class was a scaled down first class, really. They had their own end of the superstructure with a scaled down library and dining saloon. First class ranged from intricate suites to glorified second class. That was the standard for the era, though. Tasked with a route from Liverpool to Queenstown to New York, Oceanic's early years showed just how popular she was with the ladies, and men of course. When she completed her maiden voyage, she docked in New York and offered tours to raise money for some local hospitals. Her first real issue was in 1900, when her mainmast was struck by lightning while docked in Liverpool. In August of that year, the SS Bovik's cargo hold caught on fire while docked next to Oceanic, and everyone was just cool with that. Fortunately, the fire was contained. Two months go by and she runs aground off Three Castles Head in Ireland. She's able to free herself pretty soon after. But not five days go by before her anchor chain breaks while trying to dock in Liverpool, killing one man and injuring another. Don't worry though, she remained relatively safe and comfortable after that, until the following August, when she rammed and sank the coastal steamer King Cora in the dense fog of the Irish Channel. Oceanic's crew, however, were praised afterwards for saving the remaining 13 crew of the King Cora somehow giving White Star excellent PR after they sank a small ship. Oddly enough, only one dead body was ever recovered, that of Carl Friedrich Sacht, who washed up on shore and was buried soon after. They had identified him at the time, but reportedly forgot to tell his family about it until 2012, a whole 111 years after the fact. Oceanic only had some dents and scraped paint, and in the end both ships were given blame for going too fast in the fog. In October of 1905, 33 of Oceanic's firemen were arrested for refusing to go to work over a pay dispute. This was pretty common. Speaking of firemen, this time the other kind, a fire broke out in one of her steerage compartments. It was contained but the damages were expensive with as much as $10,000 worth of repairs. Don't worry though, it's all smooth sailing from here. <coughs> as if her luck couldn't improve on the 21st of March 1911. Oceanic was once again struck by lightning, this time in a storm, tearing off a good chunk of her foremast which crashed into the bridge, narrowly missing the first funnel and glass dome, as well as missing First Officer Charles Lightoller. Only a month after the sinking of the Titanic, Oceanic discovered Titanic's collapsible lifeboat A, with three dead bodies still on board. Contrary to popular belief, these weren't castaways who survived for weeks after the sinking. Instead, Collapsible A took 13 people away from Titanic, which were transferred to Lifeboat 14 soon after. They intentionally left the three dead bodies on board, unable to practically transfer them over. Her worst voyage for guests was probably the one in early February of 1914, when a rogue wave drenched passengers and smashed three deckhouse windows, a stateroom window, and then Oceanic arrived two days late because of winter storms later encountered that coated all of her rigging and decks with thick ice and snow, making it almost impossible to go outside. As you know by now, 1914 was also the year all this happened, and now Great Britain is at war with the Krauts. RMS Oceanic is one of the first ships commissioned by the British Admiralty at the outbreak of the war. And based on her past career, it won't surprise you at all that she was the first Allied ship lost in the war as well. I kid you not, a little over a month after Britain's entry into the war, before most soldiers had even encountered Germans at the Marne, Oceanic wrecked on some rocks in the Shetland Islands. Wikipedia puts it best by stating, In the end, it appears to have been poor navigation, rather than enemy action that was to doom Oceanic. Ships were supposed to take a zigzag course to throw off U-boats, but this required some top-tier navigation to pull off. With the current captain being an experienced sailor and the former captain of Oceanic assisting him with operations of the ship, no one doubted her abilities. On September 7th, however, her navigator placed her southwest of the island of Fola. Fula? Fala? Fala? She was actually 13 miles north of his charted position, thus east of the island instead of west, placing them on a collision course with a reef. Now, the Oceanic does have some good luck here, as one of the officers disagreed with the navigational tactics the captain was taking for such a large ship, and as soon as he took over the morning watch, he rerouted them to sail west, believing to be out to sea. This actually put them on a course right between the reef and the island, instead of onto the reef. Fortunately, however, the captain felt the shift and came up to redirect orders back directly towards the reef. Naturally, the ship grounded. A rescue effort ensued, with Charles Lytola reportedly being the last man off the ship, taking the navigation room's clock as a souvenir for some reason. While the captain, once on shore, said nothing would ever move such a great ship, a local reportedly said, I give her two weeks. Two weeks later, a terrible storm hit that decimated the ship and reduced her to scattered wreckage around the sea floor. 
Some salvage efforts occurred in later years, as recently as the 70s, but some stuff still remains there to this day, indicated by this ever so slightly darker portion on Google Earth. So what did we learn? Just because you're beautiful on the inside, doesn't mean the world will treat you any better.